The Baqi'a cemetery is considered to be the oldest cemetery in the Islamic world. On the 8th of Shawwal, 1344 after Hijrah, April 1925, the famous shrines housing the graves of the family of the Holy Prophet, as well as the companions of the Prophet, were destroyed. The most outstanding and brilliant of individuals buried in the cemetery of Baqi are the four Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Today, you are not allowed to read dua. You are not allowed to take any book in there. Women are not allowed to go there. Where is the justice? No more violence! No more desertion! We need to protect those worship places and neutralize them away from the destruction and the horrible results of war. It is of the utmost importance that we recognize that Jannatul Baqiyah is not a cause for the followers of the Ahlul Bayt or the Shia or indeed the Muslims, but for all humanity. The Baqi'a Cemetery is a place of great importance because today we are told there are more than 10,000 graves of companions and members of the family of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon them. Historical accounts tell us that after the Hijrah, the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam from Mecca to Medina, many of the houses were physically connected to the cemetery, Al-Baqi'a, linked through small streets and alleyways. One of these houses in this location was given to Aqil ibn Abu Talib, the cousin of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, this area between the Prophet's mosque and Jannatul Baqi', he had a house there, the brother of Amir al muminin salam Allahi alayh. And amongst those houses were the houses of other companions. But the prominent house here we want to discuss is the house of Aqil ibn Abu Talib. And this house was turned into the resting place for the Ahlul Bayt within Jannatul Baqi' and became known as Maqbarat Bani Hashim, the cemetery of the family of Hashim. In fact, um, we see many people in those days would pass the cemetery as for example they would leave their home to go to the Prophet's mosque. People would visit the cemetery to evaluate their life, to think about death because visiting the cemetery makes you think about the Akhirah, about the afterlife and therefore it makes you humble. The Baqiya Cemetery started off as a small place 80 meters squared, but today it is approximately 175,000 meters squared. And it is often known as Baqi'ul Gharqad, which is translated as the field of thorny trees because this was how it was initially, but today is known as Jannatul Baqi'a, the Garden of Baqi'a, due to the existence of the graves of some noble individuals within it. Before the migration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Medina, this was a vast garden on the western side of the city known as Yathrib. In the year one after Hijrah, meaning after the migration, the first individual to be buried from amongst the Muslims in this particular cemetery was a man who was from the Khazraj tribe. His name was As'ad ibn Zurara, and he was considered amongst the Ansar, the helpers of the Holy Prophet, the first Sahabi from the migrants, the Muhajireen, to be buried in Jannatul Baqi' was a man who was noble, respected, revered, and beloved to the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, Uthman ibn Mad'un, Radwanullahi Ta'ala alayhi in the year. Second after Hijrah, he was buried in Baqi' cemetery. And what happened was that the Holy Prophet himself buried him there and placed a rock 
on the uh, grave itself and identified it as the grave of Uthman ibn Mav'un. Thereafter, during the life of the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him and his family, a number of prominent individuals were also buried there. The daughters of the Holy Prophet, Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, some have disputed whether they are daughters of the Prophet or adopted daughters of the sister of uh, Khadija, peace and blessings be upon Khadija, and the Prophet indeed adopted them. They are buried also in close proximity. They all died during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the fourth year after Hijrah, after the migration of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam to Medina, the noble and pious mother of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, Fatima bint Asad was buried in Baqi'ah. She was a firm supporter of Islam and the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and her sacrifices and her loyalty are recorded in history and they were embodied by her character and by her husband Abu Talib and her sons especially Ali and Ja'far peace be upon them at the same time her burial is mentioned in history as a time of grief for the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as it is referred that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam mentioned that Fatima bint Asad is like his own mother. Remember, after the Prophet's mother Amina passed away when he was only five years old and after his grandfather Abdul Muttalib passed away, the Holy Prophet was under the care of Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad. So her demise upset the Holy Prophet and he was present at her burial when she was being buried and he placed his own cloak to wrap her body when she passed away. The most outstanding and brilliant of individuals buried in the cemetery of Baqi are the four Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, the Arab three sinless individuals chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the leaders and sources of guidance for mankind. The first of them buried in Baqiyah is Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba, peace and blessings be upon him, who was uh, martyred on the 7th of uh, the month of Safar in the year 50 after migration and was buried there. After him, as far as the Imams that are buried in that cemetery is Imam Ali Zain Al-Abideen Al-Sajjad, who peace and blessings be upon him, 25th of Muharram year 95 after Hijrah is when he was buried in that particular spot right next to Imam Al-Hasan. Then we have Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salam, Muhammad Al-Baqir, who is the son of Imam Al-Sajjad, peace and blessings be upon them. And he was martyred on the 7th of the Al-Hijjah in the year 114 after Hijrah. And finally, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, the son of Imam Al-Baqir, who was martyred on the 25th of Shawwal, 148 after Hijrah and buried in that particular place. So there are four graves that are quite distinguished today that we see that had huge domes before and were visited for hundreds of years, honored by Muslim, Sunni and Shia from all over the world, are what the main in individuals buried in this particular cemetery. Hence why four of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, out of the 12 Imams, four of the Imams are buried in one location in Jannatul Baqi'ah. Imagine the Barakah, imagine how sacred the site is that four of the grandsons of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are buried there. Same time, we find others who are buried in Jannatul Baqi' of notable reference, including the uncle of the Holy Prophet, Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, who died in the year 32 after Hijrah on the 14th of Rajab. We find Fatima bint Asad, the mother of Amir al Mu'mineen, who is buried in proximity to the four graves of the four Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt Some of the Muslims believe that that grave is the grave of Sayyida Fatima as Zahra, peace and blessings be upon her, but that is not established through historical records because the grave of Sayyida Fatima is hidden and no one is able to know exactly the location. Other personalities in Jannatul Baqi' include Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, some suggest Ten of the wives of the Holy Prophet are buried in Jannatul Baqi', including the pious lady Umm Salama, of course. Uh, Khadija, of course, is buried in Jannatul Mu'alla in Mecca. Some may think that Khadija 
was buried in Baqi' but this of course is not the case because she passed away while the Holy Prophet was still in Mecca and she is buried in Jannatul Mu'alla the same year that the uncle of Rasulullah also passed away who is also buried there Abu Talib buried in Mecca which incidentally was also destroyed and we must also raise awareness about Jannatul Mu'alla this location and call for it also to be rebuilt in Jannatul Baqi' we also have for example Abdullah ibn Ja'far Abdullah the son of Ja'far al-Tayyar who is the husband of As-Sayyida al-Aqila Zainab alayhi salam also buried in Jannatul Baqi' and of course this great and noble lady the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam this woman who teaches us sacrifice and loyalty Umm al banin is also uh, mentioned to be buried in Jannatul Baqi'ah. A key thing to understand is that the graves of the Imams, peace and blessings be upon them, today in Baqi'ah, initially was the house of Aqil, the son of Abu Talib. And this was something that was common at that time for people to be buried inside houses. You see, the Holy Prophet ﷺ was buried in his house. You see, for example, the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, the 10th and the 11th Imams, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari, were buried in their house. It was a very common thing. And later on, this particular house of Aqil, which contained the grave of, first of all, Fatima bint Asad, Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayha, and a number of other members of the Ahlul Bayt This later on became uh, a place where, of course, the domes of the Ahlul Bayt were constructed, were visited, and were seen and documented by a number of historians who came and said that we saw visibly these particular domes on this particular site that were renovated, built from time to time by ruler after ruler. And also, a very interesting point that we must mention when speaking about Jannatul Baqi' is that Baytul Ahzan, the house of sorrow, was also a location in Baqi'. What is the house of sorrow? Following the tragic events of the attack on the house of Ali and Fatima after the demise of the Holy Prophet wasallam, the Prophet's daughter Fatima alayha afdalu salati wa salam would be in so much grief she would cry during the day and cry during the night her crying her mourning was throughout the day and throughout the night so much so that the neighbors started to complain they come to Ali ibn Abi Talib they say Fatima weeps day and night we cannot sleep at night due to it and we cannot find respite during the day we want you to tell Fatima that either weep at night and remain silent during the day or weep during the day and remain silent at night. Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi would go and inform Fatima about the complaints of the neighbors. Fatima would say, O oh, Abel Hassan, my life among these people is very short and soon I will be departing by Allah. I shall weep constantly until I unite with my father, the messenger of Allah. And therefore Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam builds Fatima a house near the cemetery, Jannatul Baqi'ah. And he names this house later on, it's named Bayt, the house of Ahzan. And narrations mention she would take Hassan and Hussein and she would hold their hand and she would go towards this location. Some narrations mention that there was a tree that she would sit under that would provide shade for her and her sons. The enemies would come and cut this tree to make sure that Fatima doesn't sit here. Look at the hatred that some had for the Holy Prophet and his family. She would sit there and she would mourn and she would cry and she would say Subbat alayya musaibun law annaha subbat ala al-ayyami sarna layaliya She would address her father. She would say, oh dear father, 
Verily my sorrow is every day a new sorrow. And my heart by Allah has turned restless. There is an increase each day in my grief and your separation has not been easy for me. O oh my father, so many tragedies have befallen on me. If they had befallen on the day, they would turn into nights. Furthermore, we have narrations that suggest that Fatima alayhi salam was buried in Jannatul Baqi'ah. But of course, the burial site of Fatima, the daughter of the Holy Prophet, is unknown to us till today. Her grave is a secret. Her grave is hidden from us. And she was buried in the darkness of the night by her beloved husband, Ali ibn Abi Talib. But one narration mentions that the location of the grave may be in Baqi'ah. As Muslims, we follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah and the Ahl al-Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them. And of course, Baqi'ah, one of the important elements about it and its significance is the fact that it was beloved to the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, and they used to visit on a regular base, basis this particular cemetery. So for example, the Holy Prophet وسلم, is recorded to have visited the cemetery of Baqi'ah on Thursday nights and on other occasions. For example, uh, one of his wives, Aisha, says that when it came to the Prophet, he would leave his bed at night he would uh, I would follow him and see that he would enter Baqi he used to say stay there for a while raise his hands supplicate ask forgiveness for those who are buried in Baqi and upon his return I would ask him and he would say I have been commanded to pray for the people of Baqi there are narrations also that indicate that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on one occasion on the eve of 15th of Sha'ban went to the cemetery of Baqi' and would supplicate and Jibra'il alayhi salam would descend and would speak to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Well, importantly, the Prophet used to pray inside Baqi' as well. There are a number of narrations that he used to perform salah there quite often and he would indeed be seen performing the salah inside this cemetery. And this is important. Why? Because it's narrated in Sunni and Shia uh, narrations that the Prophet actually performed the salah in Baqi'ah. Whereas today, salah inside this cemetery is not allowed for Muslims. And this is, of course, going against what the Prophet of Islam himself would do. It's a sunnah from the Prophet himself. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam would visit the sacred site. He would come to the cemetery and actually make dua in this location and actually seek forgiveness for those that are buried in Jannatul Baqi'ah. He would come in the middle of the night, we are told. He would sit here. He would raise his hands towards the heavens and pray for those that are buried in Baqi'ah. And when asked, Ya Rasulullah, why do you do this? He clearly mentions, that I have been ordered, I have been commanded to pray for those buried in Baqi'ah. And this is mentioned by all books of Islamic history. It was not only Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam who would visit Jannatul Baqi'ah, it was the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as salam themselves as well. A number of narrations highlight how the Ahl al-Bayt loved to go towards that particular site. For example, we are told that Ibn Abbas narrates that on one particular night, I uh, saw Ali ibn Abi Talib who held my hands and we went to Baqi after the prayers of Isha. He asked me to recite the Bismillah and then he gave me a description of the secrets of the letter Ba within the uh, sentence of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and this continued until Fajr, but why was it in Baqi'ah? Why did Imam alayhi salam take Ibn Abbas to this particular site, other than the fact that it was an important sacred land? Similarly, it is um, narrated that a number of other Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt would come to Jannatul Baqi'ah, like for example, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had that confrontation with Abu Sufyan in Baqi'ah, when Abu Sufyan would be an individual who would mock the religion of Islam and Imam alayhi salam would look at him and say, may Allah disgrace your elderly age and your face. And he humiliated him in Baqi'ah because Imam alayhi salam was seen in that particular place. Our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam mentions whoever visits an Imam whose 
obedience is wajib, obligatory, he will attain the reward of an accepted hajj. If you visit one imam, and his obedience of course is a wajib, is an obligation upon you, you what? It's as if you have done an accepted hajj. You get the thawab of a hajj. And in Baqir, you don't visit one imam, but you visit four imams whose obedience is wajib. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is also narrated to have said, whoever visits me, their sins will be forgiven and they will not die poor. This is a beautiful narration because Imam also says, not only will your sins be forgiven, but you will not die poor. But then someone comes forward and says, I know this person who visited Imam al-Sadiq, who visited Jannatul al baqi but he died poor. How is this the case? And there are many different ways that we can answer this question. But an answer that stands out for me is that if you have the true wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib in your heart, if you have the love of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his pure progeny, can you be poor? Of course not. Therefore what the Imam is saying, if you have the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt, you will not die poor. Not only did Ali Muhammad visit the cemetery of Baqir, but also highlighted the benefits, the reward, the thawab of the visitation of this particular cemetery. For example, Imam al-Askari is narrated to have said, whomsoever visits Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and his father will not suffer from any eye ailments, nor will they die facing tribulations. Uh, Imam al-Sadiq himself says, if any one of you performs the Hajj, then let them end the pilgrimage with our visitation. And it's narrated that, of course, uh, Ibn Abbas says from the Holy Prophet وسلم, whoever visits Al-Hasan in Baqi', their feet will remain firm on the bridge on the day the, uh, that the feet of the people will slip. And those of us who have been to Medina will speak of the sense of tranquility, the sense of calmness when you go to Medina. When you walk around Medina near the holy mosque of the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam where he was buried near jannatul baqi' where the imams are buried around this area you feel the presence of the ahlul bayt because this location is their home in fact the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam once sees his beloved grandson al hasan alayhi salam and says to him whoever visits you after your death or visits your father or visits your brother, paradise becomes wajib upon them. Paradise, Jannah, is granted to them. That particular area where there was the graves of the Imam were considered quite sacred by whom? By the people because they recognized it was respected by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in the, one of the oldest books or which details the history of Medina, it's known as Wafa al Wafa, and the author is Al Samhudi. He narrates, he's a non Shia historian of Medina. He narrates from Ibn Zubala, who narrates from Khalid ibn Ausaja, who said, I was supplicating at the corner of the house of Aqil ibn Abi Talib when I saw Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq. He asked me, Are you standing here for a reason? And I said, No. So Imam al Sadiq saw this man next to the house of Aqil which already had the grave of Imam al-Hasan and Imam, for example, Imam al-Sajjad and probably Imam al-Baqir. When this man said, no, I'm just standing here, Imam al-Sadiq looked at him and says, this is the place where the Prophet of God used to come at night to ask forgiveness for the people of Baqir. This is exactly the place. So the Prophet وسلم, wanted to highlight the significance of the place of the burial of the Imams السلام, in Jannatul Baqir. The cemetery of Jannatul Baqir today is just a little bit of dust and rocks. On the 8th of Shawwal, 1344 after Hijra, April 1925, the famous shrines housing the graves of the family of the Holy Prophet, as well as the companions of the Prophet, were destroyed. This deliberate destruction of these holy tombs sent shockwaves throughout the Muslim world and today continues to receive attention and awareness. It's important to realize 
that the cemetery of Baqi has gone through two destructions and not one. Because many a times people refer to the latest one which happened in 1925, whereas a study of historical accounts show that it was actually destroyed on two occasions. If we look at the, uh, the uh, time of April 1801, we find that the Saudi army supported by the Wahhabi movement invaded Karbala and mercilessly attacked the shrine of Imam al Hussein salam and his brother Abu al-Fadl Abbas salam. They caused severe damage, they left, they tried to do so the next year but the inhabitants of Karbala were able to protect the shrines. In that second year after the attack to Karbala, the army invaded Mecca. They entered the city they destroyed mosques and historical sites, as well as the famous cemetery of Al Mu'alla. They brought down the domes that were erected for hundreds of years over the graves of noble people, that such as Khadija and Abu Talib, salamullahi alayhim. And they destroyed the site of the birth of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Baqarah mentions, Woman adlamu mimman mana'a masajid Allah. أن يذكر في هسمه وسعى في خرابها. Who is greater? Who is the greater wrongdoer than him who prevents the names of Allah being mentioned, i.e., praised in the mosques of Allah, and strives towards their destruction? Allah says, such people may not enter them except in fear. For them in this world is disgrace and they will have in the hereafter a greater punishment. Furthermore, it's important to understand that this cemetery isn't for Shia only. It is for all Muslims. And I would argue for all of humanity. These graves are places of respect and sites of worship and therefore the reconstruction of Jannah al baqiq will bring about Islamic unity and demonstrate that Muslims respect one another and more importantly, respect the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam and his holy family. Peace and salutations be upon them all. In 1805, this army moved from Mecca towards Medina. And throughout the process of 18 months, they looted the city. They destroyed what they wished. And amongst the places in which they destroyed was the Baqiya Cemetery. They, for example, took away all the gifts that were presented to the shrine from various kings and dignitaries. They erased all the shrines to the ground in the cemetery. And that was the first destruction of the cemetery. This destruction caused uproar in the Muslim world. And eventually the Ottomans were able to attack and drive the army out of these particular cities. And the shrines were rebuilt once again. The domes were rebuilt once again. But unfortunately, in 1925, and uh, again uh, over a year after Mecca had fallen, the Saudi army entered Medina. This was led by Abdul Aziz Al Saud. And because of the fear of the backlash of the Muslims, initially the Baqiya cemetery was not destroyed. But after within a period of five months, he commanded one of the jurists to issue the edict allowing the destruction of the tombs and the shrines in Medina. The jurists arrived in Medina in the month of Ramadan 1344 and they then issued this edict which resulted in the army moving towards the cemetery.
every year on the 8th of Shawwal, we mark the day of sorrow, Yawmul Gham, where many Shias around the world hold events remembering and commemorating this sad day that the cemetery of Jannatul Baqi' was destroyed. Many Muslims come out on this day to protest the destruction of Jannatul Baqi'. O oh, sons of Al Saud, what have you to do with the sons of Fatima, the ones whose father was born in the direction of your sujood? What is it you want from them? What is it you have not made clear? You have already violated the sanctity of Allah when the coverings over their graves you cleared. They are the martyrs of Islam, they are the foundation of the land, yet they're buried beneath your rubble and not a plaque is left to stand. <laughs> When you look at the history of this cemetery, you'll recognize a number of historians, travelers who documented and saw that there were domes on these particular graves. The exact date of the construction of these particular domes and huge mausoleums is not established in history, yet it seemed to have occurred between the year 486 and 498 after Hijra during the rule of the Seljuk Empire. Now, testimonies from those alive near the time confirm this. For example, a scholar by the name of Abdul Jalil al Qazwini wrote in the year 556 after Hijra, the dome of Al Hassan ibn Ali is next to the place of the burial of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, and it was built by the command of Majd al Malik. <laughs> Throughout history, many scholars and many human rights activists have tried to call for the rebuilding of Jannatul Baqi'ah. For example, Allama Shaykh Abdul Rahim Al Ha'ari or Sayyid Musa Al Sadr and Ayatollah Sayyid Hassan Al Shirazi in the late 60s. It is mentioned that he would uh, campaign and gather support to place pressure on the Saudi authorities to rebuild Jannatul Baqi'ah. He personally spent many years to try and gain support for this movement. And he would make this his mission in life to protest against the demolition of Jannatul Baqi'ah. Some eyewitnesses mentioned that Sayyid Hassan would always in every gathering speak about the importance of rebuilding Jannatul Baqi'ah. And Sayyid Hassan in fact was able to meet the king at the time, I believe King Faisal, and present him with evidence why Jannatul Baqi'ah should be rebuilt. However, this wasn't done. Many extremists that were around the king Many of those involved in the politics in those days did not allow for the rebuilding of Jannatul Baqi'ah. And of course, Ayatollah Sayyid Hassan al Shirazi was killed in 1980 at the hands of the Ba'athist regime who had sent someone to kill him while he was in Beirut. This is one day in one era in history. I ask you to turn back the hands of time to come to a different era. The era and the time is April 21st, 1925. The city is Medina in Saudi Arabia. There is destruction that takes place at the hands of the Saudi regime and levels the cemetery of Baqi to the ground. 94 years on, not a single promise has been made to rebuild this site by these people. When someone asks a question, whether something is shirk or not. We have to immediately respond by saying, what is the definition of shirk? Shirk is when an individual associates a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reality today is if we look at the Muslim world, there are many places in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped and within it there are graves and nobody is worshipping those individuals in the graves. Everybody is worshipping Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. These particular places of worship exist in so many countries around the world. 
Many of them are Muslim countries, for example, in Turkey, for example, in Morocco, for example, in Tunisia, in Egypt. There are many, many places of worship which have graves in them. And there is no evidence whatsoever from reliable narrations from the Holy Prophet وسلم, that prohibits the prayer in an area where there is a grave. And the biggest evidence is, of course, the mosque of the Holy Prophet, where his grave exists and the grave of a number of other companions exists as well. Whereas nobody says you are not allowed to pray and worship Allah there. It is within the same confounds. It's very important to know why and the reason why we are here. Because almost a hundred years ago, these people and people associated with them went to the graves of people that were dear to the Holy Prophet and destroyed them. They desecrated, they disrespected, and they looted the tombs that were there. And we are here today because that message will live on through us. We will not let them forget what they've done. We will not let those actions be lost to history. We have so much evidence to say that building shrines on graves isn't forbidden. And this has been the case for centuries. Only when you see the emergence of the school of Ibn Taymiyyah, we see that this idea of shirk comes about, that you cannot have a shrine, you cannot have a construction, you cannot have a building on top of a grave. Otherwise, throughout history, this was something that was normal. I personally visited this year the shrine attributed to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Cairo and visited the shrine attributed to his sister, as Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam in Cairo. And I saw a mosque built there, and I saw a shrine, and I saw Muslims who are not Shia, Muslims from other schools of thought, all coming, and I even heard them, and I saw them with my eyes calling out, Madad ya Hussein. And I heard them say, Madad ya Sit Zainab. They were asking for help, and when I asked them, I said, how are you asking for help from someone that's died? They said, we are asking Allah through these holy personalities. Not far from you here, how many monuments we have in Washington? How many monuments? Celebrating, paying a tribute, respecting to the leaders who built this nation. But look what Saudi Arabia does on the contrary. The house where a prophet Muhammad was born is demolished. Hundreds, rather thousands of historic sites, religious sites, spiritual sites that belongs to all Muslims have been eliminated and destroyed and demolished by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. My friends, the destruction of al baqir and many other religious sites in Mecca and Medina is a crime not only against Muslims, but a crime against the humanity. It's a crime against the humanity. al baqir has to be restored. And many other monuments have to be restored. This is a crime against Islam and humanity. Similarly, next to the Holy Kaaba, there are graves of probably over 70 prophets. Some say over 300 prophets are buried within, for example, Hijr of Ismail. Ismail السلام, as a prophet, Hajr, his own mother, is buried in that particular place known as Hijr Ismail, but people pray there. And therefore, the accusation that praying neck inside a place where there is a grave is unfounded. It's not based on any reliable evidence. And within Islamic teachings, Sunni and Shia, many places are present where people come and worship Allah and Allah alone. Nowhere in these shrines do we find, whether it's in Karbala or Mashhad or Sham or Samarra, or in any place where there is a shrine or a grave, are people worshipping and praying towards an individual, considering that individual to be a God who they associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all about monotheism, it's all about Tawheed, and this idea that was brought forward and espoused by Ibn Taymiyyah, developed by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, that prohibits the building of shrines uh, and the worship inside areas where there's a grave is an innovation in itself. 
It's something that is constructed from the minds of this particular individual. Extremist way of showing it, but also today used by terrorists to blow up places of worship. Innocent people are killed in the name that they are using, trying to use Tawheed as a justification, but they are far away from monotheism and this whole pure concept of the oneness of God. For example, in Surah Al-Kahf, when the people found Ashab Al-Kahf, they had been buried in this location. They disputed, Allah mentions this in the Quran, they disputed amongst themselves about this matter. Then a group of them said, let's what? Let's build a building, a shrine over them. And those who had their say in this matter said, we will set up what? A place of worship over them. We will what create a masjid on top of these graves. If there was anything wrong with this, Allah would have said this is shirk in the Holy Quran. Today, another example, today the station of Ibrahim known as Maqam Ibrahim. Allah says this station is a place of prayer. This place where today you go to the Holy Kaaba and you see this location known as Maqam Ibrahim where Ibrahim السلام, stood to build the Holy Kaaba and you see the footprint which re represents the station where Ibrahim السلام, stood and it's quite a big footprint those of you that have visited uh, the Holy Kaaba and seen Maqam Ibrahim the first thing you will notice that it's quite a big uh, Maqam and the actual footstep is quite big. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah that this station is what? Is now a musalla, a place of prayer. These are all signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which we must honor, we must respect. And if there was anything wrong, the Holy Prophet would not visit Jannah al -Baqir. If there was anything wrong, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would mention in the Quran that oh you people who built this mosque on top of the people of the cave, you must destroy it. Allah mentions we must honor the signs of Allah as this brings humbleness to the heart. ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Therefore, it is a demand of every Muslim, of every human, that we protest against the demolition of Jannah al -Baqir and call for the rebuilding of Jannah al -Baqir. Furthermore, those of us who want to visit these shrines, we must be allowed to visit them. Those who want to show respect, those who want to show their love to these personalities, those who want to show their honor to these personalities who are what? Who are the grandchildren of the Holy Prophet. They must be respected. And those who want to seek nearness to Allah through these personalities, they must be allowed to do so. We must be allowed to do the ziyara of Jannah al -Baqir and stand next to these graves and pray next to these graves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for intercession through these personalities. Therefore, the 8th of Shawwal is a day for all Muslims. This day, Yawm al the day of sorrow, all Muslims should come together and demand their local government to influence change. This is extremely now uh, critical because so many countries around the world are facing horrible wars and destruction and usually people during wars target worship places because they know that those places are focal points for many communities and they they are linked together in an emotional way because they carry their memories they carry part of their identity also it's a cultural express for this amazing life in every community. Because of that, we need to protect those worship places and neutralize them away from the destruction and the horrible results of war. 
My message is that every community in the whole world has the right to worship and to have their sacred places where they can emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, and culturally be connected to and have the right to protect. It is of the utmost importance that we recognize that Jannah al is not a cause for the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt or the Shia or indeed the Muslims, but for all humanity. Here we are talking about a sacred place, which is one of the oldest places in history, but it has so much value to Islam and Muslims. It is important to also highlight that the cemetery of Baqi does not belong to any government, including the Saudi government. It belongs to the Muslim world. And it is the right of the Muslim world to determine how it should be presented. And it is a grave injustice to today see its state in such a manner. Not a single grave is identified within Jannah al -Baqi. People are not allowed to stand and recite ziyara. People are not allowed to uh, express their feelings. They're not allowed to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside Jannah al -Baqi. No one knows what's going on when they go in and they are ushered and they moved very, very quickly. It is not only about a cemetery that was leveled to the ground. It's not only about a matter of graves and domes. This is about justice. This is about the rights of these holy individuals. It's about the love that we are commanded to express and show towards the family of the Holy Prophet. And that is why it is the right of the Muslims to worship there without intimidation, without fear, without any form of persecution. On the 8th of Shawwal, on an annual basis, a day known as Yawm al-Gham, the day of sorrow and grief, Shias around the world protest, and they invite other Muslims to join them too. Cemetery of Baqir involves and includes the graves of other prominent Muslims that are not necessarily honored and revered by the Shias. And therefore, it should not only be a Shia matter. They invite others to protest to keep the spirit of the uh, demand to rebuild the shrines of Jannah al -Baqi alive. For example, today the cemetery is out of bounds for women. Women are not allowed to enter. Why? There should be demands for them to be given a specific time. If the accusation is they'll be mixing, then allow the ladies to go to the cemetery at a particular time where men are not allowed. Why is it that they are not allowed to go and pay respects in that particular place? Similarly, when it comes to certain times that the cemetery is open, it's very, very limited for people to go and pay their respects. They are not allowed to stand and to recite ziyara and they're told you have to move very, very quickly. And for example, sometimes harassed, sometimes intimidated, sometimes shouted at, where they are called all kinds of different terms and labeled and judged, for instance. At the same time, why are these sites that are so sacred and so holy are not respected and protected and looked after in the way that they deserve to be. And so the protests demand that the place is considered a heritage site, that for example, it's handed over to authorities that are able to honor it and respect it the way the Muslims would want to, and to take it back and give it its own glory as it used to be before 1925 and before its first destruction with the domes as all Muslims recognize and has as historical records clearly point. Every culture, every civilization, every society, every religion recognizes specific locations, specific places with special significance. This is something that's natural that you are proud of your heritage, you are proud of your history, you respect a place of burial, of sight of a person in history, a figure in history that, for example, served humanity, whether in their faith, whether in their religion, whatever it may be, we respect that place. Such locations are recognized as heritage and therefore are considered sacred. And this is from a non-Muslim perspective. Furthermore, from a Muslim perspective, we aren't talking about normal personalities in history. We are talking about the burial site of the grandchildren of the man who delivered this message of Islam. 
the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. We are talking about the grandson of the Holy Prophet Imam Al Hasan Al Mujtaba Alayhi Salam. We are talking about the adornment of worship Imam Zain Al Abideen Alayhi Salam. We are talking about knowledge of Al Baqir and Al Sadiq Alayhim of the Salati Wa Salam. Therefore, today you will see Muslims around the world engage in social in political campaign, in peaceful protest to demand the protection of all Islamic heritage and all sacred sites and call for the rebuilding of Jannatul Baqir. Mm -hmm.